We still have people entering, but we've got a very packed evening. So I'm going to start anyway and say welcome um, to all of you um, and to this evening's Jewish Renaissance event about the writings of Esther Kreitman. Um, I'm always excited about what we publish in Jewish Renaissance magazine. Our editor, Rebecca Taylor, I'm sure you'll agree, does a fantastic job of finding material on Jewish culture from all around the world. But I do think that this current issue um, is particularly special. Um, and one of the main reasons that it's special is because it contains an article by David Stromberg, who I'll talk about and introduce to you a little bit later on. Um, but this article that David has written for us um, includes excerpts from letters he has translated, written by Esther Kreitman to her brother, Isaac Bashevis Singer. And this is the first ever publication internationally and throughout history. Um, so I'm really delighted that we're doing that and we're bringing her work into the world and giving her a voice. A um, couple of days ago, I was at a seminar in Oxford about Jewish women's writing. And in it, all the speakers kept talking about an essay that Virginia Woolf wrote. Um, I don't know if you remember, those of you who read it, but in Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, she had an essay where she invented a sister for Shakespeare called Judith. And the whole essay was kind of, what if? What if Shakespeare had had an equally talented sister? What if a woman writer had lived at that moment in time? What would have happened to her work? What would her writing life have been like? What would her reputation be now? Well, the amazing thing with, is in the Yiddish landscape, we don't have to imagine a what if. We have that. We have the perfect candidate and example of a Yiddish woman writer set against probably the most famous Yiddish writer of all, Isaac Bashevis Singer, Nobel laureate, author of over 100 publications. But his sister Esther I believe firmly was just as talented, if not more so. And in fact, we know that she was the one who taught her brothers, not just Isaac Bashevis Singer, but Israel Joshua, to read and appreciate literature. So that's who today's session is dedicated to. Singer's sister, or to give her her real name, Esther Kreitman. Or perhaps, perhaps Hinda Esther Singer. She was a woman of many names, and I'm sure that's going to come out through this evening. Names are a very important thing. But let me just very briefly introduce her so that we all have some context to the woman we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to share my screen and show you this article. So these are this is the article you will find if you read Jewish Renaissance written by David Stromberg. And I've just included the photograph of some of the letters themselves, which he's going to talk to us about a little bit later on. So they're written by Esther Kreitman, who is the sister of Israel Joshua Singer, um, very, very well known as a journalist, um, primarily with his writing in the forward or forwards, and his brother Isaac Bashevis Singer who is the author of too many books to name, really. Um, short stories such as Gimple the Fool and Yentl, novels, The Slave, Enemies, a Love Story, and many, many other works. We have pictures of the two brothers together, but the only image we have with their sister is this one. And it isn't an image created during their lifetime. This was drawn by Esther Kreitman's granddaughter, Hazel Carr, who I think might be watching this evening. Um, and Hazel drew this from family photographs. But it's the only time, as far as I know, the other speakers this evening might know more, we actually have a portrayal of Esther with her literary brothers and we have the whole literary family together. So we're 
going to do our best today to give her her rightful place. Um, this is a photograph of Esther Kreitman a little bit later on in her life, um, when she was in her late 30s, early 40s, I believe. And she um, was born in Poland, but she left it in 1912, going to Berlin to marry Abraham Kreitman and then straight with him to Antwerp. Um, he was a diamond cutter and she joined him there in the hope that that is where he would make a living, something he didn't seem to achieve very well, actually. Um, she wrote her book, her first book, Does Shade and Tance, originally published in English translation as Deborah. Um, and it was published by Virago and also by David Paul. And I know David Paul is also in the audience this evening. Um, I saw him join the Zoom, so we might have some questions for him possibly later on. But originally, initially, it went to press in 1936, which is just one year after Isaac Bashevis Singer's literary debut. So it really is the two Singer siblings side by side, in their initial phases as writers. Um, but unlike him, who was championed, she never even got a review in the foreword, which was the prominent Yiddish newspaper her brothers worked for in America. Um, she, by that point, was already 45 years old and Europe was on the verge of World War II. Um, she lived throughout the war in Britain um, and she wrote short stories that were published later as Yichas, or in English, The Blitz and other stories about that experience. She also published a second novel, Brilliantin, or Diamonds, which was about the Antwerp diamond cutter scene. Um, although these are all works of fiction, her short stories and her novels, very much fiction, I would say all of them are semi-autobiographical. They're inspired by events in her life. And that blurring of the autobiographical and the semi-autobiographical um, and the fiction might come out in a moment as Susanna begins to read from us from those opening pages of that first novel, Deborah. Um, and just to add that Esther was a keen supporter of the Haskalah, of the secular Jewish enlightenment and as we're going to find out a bit later in the evening um, was involved in the London Yiddish literary scene. Um, here she is at a salon and I know Vivi is going to talk about this a little bit later on and contextualise her in the London literary world and then we're going to pass on to Jessica to finish off this evening um, who will then look at her amongst other Jewish women writers who were writing in Yiddish um, and just and have a little bit of a look at that female Yiddish pantheon maybe I'm being a bit of generous using that word so that's the plan for this evening we're going to start with Deborah we're, which is going to be read by Susanna Wise we're then going to go on to hear all about his discovery and translation and work with the letters from David Stromberg Vivi will take Esther Kreitman and contextualise her within the London Yiddish literary scene and Jessica within the wider Yiddish world, particularly the world of female writers. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of them this evening, um, as I know you are. And we're going to start with Susanna, who's going to read for us from Deborah. So actor Susanna Wise has appeared on many television shows, including EastEnders, Marcella and Peep Show. Her work on stage includes Chekhov's Three Sisters and Festen in the West End, The Holy Rosenbergs and The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie at The National. And in June, she's going to be appearing on stage at the Almeida in Alma Mata alongside Leah Williams. But fittingly for this evening, and one of the reasons we invited Susanna to be Esther Kreitman's voice, is that she is also a Jewish woman writer. Um, Susanna's published two novels with Orion, and as a screenwriter, she's currently in development with Northern Ireland Screen, adapting AJ West's award-winning debut, The Spirit Engineer, for television. But like Esther Kreitman, um, Susanna also writes semi-autobiographically. So I know her original 
six part comedy drama ish which is loosely based on her own life is currently on submission so we're very much looking forward to one day doing an event like this about Susanna's writing too but for now I'm going to pass over to her to give us a little of Esther Kreitman's literary work hello everyone thank you Aviva so I'm reading from Deborah um chapter one it was the sabbath and even the wind and the snow rested from their labours. The village of Jelhits, a small cluster of wooden cottages and hovels, stood hidden away from sight at the edge of the Polish pine woods. To all appearances, nothing more than one of the many snowdrifts covering the land. But within, Jews were comfortably asleep in their beds after the heavy, heavy Sabbath dinner. All was silent in the village, but nowhere was the quietude so impressive as in the large house by the synagogue, which stood facing the common meadowland and the frozen river. Here lived the rabbi, Reb Avram Bear, and unlike most of his flock, he did not snore in his sleep. As for Rizala, his wife, her breathing was so gentle that whenever Deborah peeped into the bedroom, to see whether her parents were astir yet. The 14-year-old child grew anxious, wondering whether her mother was breathing at all. The warmth and the shadowiness of falling dusk were cosy inside the rabbi's house. But Deborah, as she sat beside the tiled stove, reading, felt lonely and sorry for herself to the point of tears. Earlier in the day, she had overheard her father say, Michael is showing great promise in his studies, the Lord be praised. One day he will be a brilliant Talmudist. Michael was her younger brother, who, in accordance with the centuries-old custom of Orthodox Jews, was being brought up to spend all the days of his life in the study of the Talmud. And, Father, what am I going to be one day? Deborah then suddenly inquired, half in jest, half in earnest. For as long as she could remember, never had a word of praise fallen to her lot. Rev, Reb Avram Bear was taken aback. It was an accepted view among pious Jews that there was only one achievement in life a woman could hope for, the bringing of happiness into the home by ministering to her husband and bearing him children. Therefore, he did not even vouchsafe Deborah a reply. But when she pressed him, he answered simply, What are you going to be one day? Well, nothing, of course. This response did not at all satisfy Deborah. It was quite true that most girls grew up only to marry and become drudges, but there were exceptions, such as her own mother, Rizala, who was highly educated, a real lady, and as wise as any man. To be sure, in his heart of hearts, Reb Avram Bear disapproved of his wife's erudition. He thought it wrong for a woman to know too much and was determined that this mistake should not be repeated in Deborah's case. Now, there was in the house a copy of Naimonovich's Russian grammar, which Deborah always studied in her spare moments. But whenever her father caught her at this mischief, he would hide the book away on top of the tiled stove out of her reach and then she would have to risk her very life to recover it. She would move the table up against the stove, set a chair on the table, herself on the chair, and after all that trouble, clouds of dust and loose leaves from torn books, disused feather dusters and God knows what else would come fluttering and tumbling down. Everything, in fact, except the Russian grammar. Nevertheless, during her 14 years of life, she had managed to learn all its contents by heart, and still she was dissatisfied. How tediously morning changed into afternoon and evening into night. How wearisome was her housework, and yet, beyond that, she had few real interests. She was forever lacking something, herself hardly knowing what. A strange yearning would stir in her, an almost physical, gnawing sensation. But it had never been 
before been so painful as on this wintry Sabbath afternoon, when all was quiet within and the world outside was muffled with snow. She sought refuge in daydreams. She recalled how the family had first come to Gelhitz many years ago, arriving at nightfall, how the bearded, pious Jews, in long gabardines, black top boots and peaked cylindrical caps, a fashion surviving from the Middle Ages, came forward with lighted candles to greet their new rabbi, crying in unison, Blessed be thy coming. What a splendid figure Reb Avram Bear had cut in his rabbinical garb, black buckled shoes, white stockings, satin gabardine and broad-brimmed black felt hat. As she remembered all this and saw again the smile, grateful and almost childish, that had settled in Reb Avram Bear's longish fair beard, hot tears slowly trickled down her flushed cheeks, senseless tears for which she could find no justification. When Michael burst into the room and found his sister crying, a psalter in her hand, he laughed so boisterously that his parents woke up in the next room. Michael and Deborah were never on very friendly terms, and he snatched this opportunity of poking fun at her, calling her a fool for staying indoors, for poring over the Psalms with tears in her eyes like a miserable old sinner, whiling away dull old age with penitence. As for himself, he had been out on the river, which stretched away frozen, hard as a sheet of steel, with snow-covered fields all around, with a blue, transparent Sabbath sky hanging above, wonderfully silent. After his exertions, Michael's cheeks were flushed, his ears tingling with frostbite, and the bright gleam in his eyes flashed with ever-changing tints, now black, now brown, then coppery. He had come back brimming over with life. And his sister, who always stayed indoors and neatly bore the stagnation of their home life, seemed to him now more pitiful than ever. He became more subdued when his father entered the room. Have you been getting on with your studies, Michael? Reb Avram Bear asked with a sleepy yawn. Yes, father. Deborah gaped. She endeavoured to catch Michael's eye, but he was reading some religious tract very studiously, and there was nothing in his now thoughtful face to betray his lie. Good God, what a wicked boy. And what was worse, he thought himself so clever and dared to make fun of her. She had a good mind to give him away. But Reb Avram Bear was asking her for a glass of hot tea and seemed to have forgotten all about Michael by now. Anyhow, not that her own conscience was any too clear. Exchanging one of her father's religious books for a work of fiction was surely an even more heinous sin than going for a slide on the ice on the Sabbath. If her father was to know of it, he would... Well, she could not imagine what he might do. Good God! How awful to exchange a holy book for a storybook! Conscience-stricken herself, she kept her tongue. But as she poured out the tea, she reflected that had she been a boy instead of a girl, she would not have found herself driven to commit such iniquities. She would have spent all her time in the study of the Talmud. But hers was a dreary lot, and even when she erred, life was still maddeningly dull. Thank you so much, um, Susanna, for giving us a little bit of Esther's voice and that wit as well, which is so important. And in case anyone is questioning any of the pronunciations of the names, we've been advised it's Polish Yiddish. So that's why the pronunciations have been used that they are. Um, but a fantastic reading. And I know we're going to have you back a little bit later on to read some of her letters as well. So thank you. We'll see Susanna again in a moment. Um, so that was Esther Kreitman's fictional voice, um, proto-feminist as it was, and very, very interesting when you put it alongside, for example, Isaac Bashev singer's story Yentl, um, or many others of his work. You can feel the singerness. 
but to talk about that relationship between the siblings and to talk about Esther's real writing voice as we see in her letters, her non-fiction voice, um, I'm going to bring on screen now David Stromberg who I'm so delighted is joining us because he has been absolutely the driving force behind making this happen. Um, and I know this is just the beginning for him of working on um, Esther Kreitman's letters and looking at her work, we hope. So before I, I introduce him, what I wanted to say was a huge thank you because we started working on this in the autumn. Um, in fact, I met with David online on about October the 5th. I was looking at my diary um, and we decided that he was going to drive this project forward. And a couple of days later, we all know what happens on October the 7th. So the work that was done on this by David, the translation, his writing and editing of the work, his liaising with Rebecca Taylor, our amazing editor, on how it was going to look in publication, was all done under the most unbelievably difficult circumstances. And we're so grateful for you, to you, David, for managing to do this, despite, or maybe as a way to ward off what was happening outside your study door. Um, David, we've had at Jewish Renaissance before because he um, translated and edited for us a short story by Isaac Bashevis Singer a few years ago. And that's how he's usually known as um, the editor of the Isaac Bashevis Singer Literary Trust. And among his recent publications are the first volume of Singer's writings on Yiddish and Yiddishkeit, um, which are the war years, 1939 to 1945. But as well as being a translator and editor, he's very much a writer himself. Um, he's also published several speculative essays, including A Short Inquiry to the End of the World, The Eternal Hope of the Wandering Jew, and To Kill an Intellectual. Um, that's an amazing title, David. Um, I'm really delighted to have you with us and thank you for doing this work and agreeing to talk this evening. Thanks. Um ha happy to be here. Um yeah. and and uh yeah, it was it was a it was strange just to pick up on what you just said. Um we do the beginning of of uh, of October because there's no bomb shelter in our apartment. We moved to another apartment that happened to be empty because the people were in America, and um, and so a lot of this this uh, translation and and then the the writing of the essay was done on on these people's um, balcony and moments between kids running around and going to going to kindergarten, coming back from kindergarten. It was. Um, it was a kind of a surreal um, moment in time, very. Um, and I think that in many ways, uh, because some of the letters are also from from World War II, um, it was it was a way out and it was a way of, of getting some perspective and a way of understanding that um, different narratives take place in different times um, and and personal perspectives uh, are rather limited. Um, you kind of, you know, crazy things are happening outside. You may hear booms or you may hear air raid sirens, but you're also just sitting somewhere on a balcony with, with a very specific perspective that you have um, trying to do whatever you happen to be doing, which in my case was um, uh, doing these translations. So, um, so that's just a little bit of, of, of reflection of what you were saying, um, only because you know it was. It's, let's just say in Jerusalem, at least, it, uh, we we didn't realize until about a, you know a couple of weeks into it, but we were relatively safe, basically, uh, all things considered. Um, but but the psychological pressures were are are were very intense, and also you see the. Uh, implications of those psychological pressures um, going and spreading into other parts of your activities, certainly your parenting and also your your translation, your writing. 
Um, and again, I'm mentioning all this because it really just reverberates with the letters. Um, I think the letters, part of what I was so excited about um, in terms of translating them is that they um, they echo, they echo the relationship between certainly the siblings, uh, the, the, the sibling singer, the uh, the Echo also the relationship. What's that? I don't know. I heard something. Okay. I guess it went out for a second. Uh, we just lost okay. you, but we have you back uh, now, I think, David. Okay. Apologies. Um, I don't know where 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 it cut, where I got cut off, but um, um, I'll pick up where where I understood it was cut off. It's, essentially, I was talking, I was uh, reflecting on the echoes between the letters and uh, and reality. Let's say so. Um, there's the echoes between the relationship of the of the singer family, the the different siblings uh, and the parents as well, which all comes out of the letters. Um, and and then also the echoing between each member of the family in their moment in their careers. So, for example, um, it's true that in '36, both Besheva Singer and Israel Joshua Singer were writing for the Forward, uh, the year that that um, Shadim Tanz was published. But um, when we look, when we go into the, the micro of each person and we get this from, from their letters, uh, we see whole worlds just as confused and frustrated and 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 and, and insecure um, as as Esther Kreitman. Um, certainly Besheva Singer's letters from that period, certainly um, uh, Israel Joshua's letters between the two brothers, which were also some of those letters were at least one uh, was extremely tense, um, and so what 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 interested me in these letters and what what um, what I was specifically kind of what drove me to do the translation and and to and to bring them out was really showing the the very dynamic um, um, relationships. That were taking place in real time. I think when we go back and we narrativize things retrospectively, it's, everything seems to have already been laid out. Oh, this happened, and then that happened. This person published this. This person published that. They were here. They were there. And it all seems very um, sort of uh, intentional and predetermined. Whereas in reality, um, things unfolded in a lot more contingency. Certainly in the 1930s, um, in 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 the lead up to World War II. Um, but let's, I was just in relation to, to, to let's say the family dynamics and some of the things that, that, we, um, uh, that we can see in the letters that aren't necessarily as, as directly stated. I thought maybe uh, Susanna might read um, a little bit from the letter um, from uh, 1931, um, which, which appears to be relating to um to the death of uh, of of their father 27th of january 1931 though you're not addressing me directly i still feel that this is not the time for a reckoning my heart is full of deep sorrow and i know that you're grieving just as strongly over our heartfelt father whose name is more than holy even holy is not the right word. There is no other and cannot be another person as crystalline as he was. I knew him well and we loved each other, my dearest father and I. What else is there to say? As you say, everything's lost. I'm asking you at least to write and tell me how Shia's doing. He should live a long life. I'm so worried, I'm losing my mind. Ever since Maisel noticed that Shire wasn't quite all there, I've been unable to rest. Tell me the real truth and let it be a good truth. 
if there's any way for him to write me himself, let it just be two words. I'm healthy. I ask for nothing else. This is the only thing my eyes are really looking forward to seeing. Stay healthy and strong, Hinda. Thank you. Um, so, so we have a letter like that, which, which um, certainly reflects a lot of their emotions between the siblings and, and it does um, give us insight again in this kind of refracting way on the different relationships between the singers children and their father, um, which was always a, obviously a complicated relationship, but did have this kind of reverence um, that comes up in within the different uh, siblings in different ways. And, you know, for me, it's, a, it's almost amazing to hear, to hear it being read this way because um, I came across these letters now about 10 years ago um, in the archive and and I immediately scanned them, hoping one day to, 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 to do something with them. Um, and it was about three years ago that we did uh, the, the singer story um, trio um, uh, with Jewish Renaissance that then, um, in one of our conversations, you know, I mentioned these letters and I said, if you, you know, if you really want to do something really interesting, this is, Here's this thing, you know, and and I tried to get it done also by in, in by other people and and, uh, and other translators along the way. I mean, I was I was ready to just give it give it all away just to get someone to do it really, um, and it just didn't come together until until uh, until this past this past fall, um, and so that's that's a very I think I feel like a very lucky thing, and um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that as well, partly just again so that there's a re there's a kind of a uh, a reality check um you know we get a, we get a, a few pages in a magazine and it looks nice and we read it and it's interesting but um but it's 10 years of of sort of um keeping it in a particular drawer in your pocket in the back of your mind and 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 not giving up hope on on having a chance to, to get it out there uh and then finding the the kind of um uh, support that is necessary to put something like that together, uh, which does take time and effort. Um, so, so I just I just wanted to to acknowledge that as part of also, um, kind of like I said, the contingency of of a literary life in real time. Um, and with that, I thought we could also read maybe the second letter that we prepared, um, which is from uh, around 1946. I was very surprised when I got a cheque today for six pounds. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. But I want to assure you that you don't need to send me money because Avram is working and earning a living. My book, Deborah, is selling much better now. And there were many prominent reviews, as in uh, The Spectator and so on, which surely helped sales. Thank you for your good words and for the promise of a review in the forwards. But if it's too hard for you to get it done, don't strain yourself. I don't want you to have any difficulties at all on my account. But there is one thing that I would like from you, though it will probably seem ridiculous. I was assured by someone who is trustworthy that my novel, Diamonds, was published during the war in the forwards. Naturally, I had no way of getting the forwards the whole time and knew nothing about it. If it's true, I'm asking you very, very much. Please write me about this because I need to know. They will naturally never find out that you were the one who told me about it. A letter that I wrote to our mother and to Moisha a few months ago has returned with the single word, parti, which means that they've left. Maybe you can look for them in the search columns of the Forverts or other newspapers. Maybe they'll respond when they find out that someone is looking for them. I hope so. No other news. Everything is as it was. 
Thanks again. Um, and so we've so we've gone from from the early thirties um, when um, the siblings are still in in Warsaw to just after the war when uh, by which point Israel Joshua Singer is dead since nineteen forty four from a heart attack and um, and their mother and, and youngest brother is a, are are no longer in contact uh, at that point um, and are feared dead as well. Um, and and we see that she's continuing her um, her sort of pursuits, her literary pursuits, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but she's referring to Deborah, the the English translation, which have had appeared just then. Um, and and continuing, continuing to pursue her life um, very much with the help and support of her son, uh, Maurice Carr, who translated the novel as well, uh, the father of Hazel Carr, um, and who who was her main um, uh, advocate um, uh, and translator. Uh, so you know, this is a little. A little bit of a hint. There's there's much more to be said, certainly, um, but but this is the this is the beginning sort of of um, not just making her own voice available for the first time, but also maybe starting to integrate these different voices in a story that's a little um, that has a little more shading um, than than has happened until now. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, David. And we'll bring you back a little later on to answer questions. I'm sure our audience has a lot of questions about the material, um, both how you found it and also some of the things it tells us about her life. Um, so we'll welcome you back for the Q&A later on. Um, so, You've begun to hear a little bit about Esther Kreitman and what makes her so interesting. Um, and I'm now really excited to bring Dr. Vivi Lax onto the screen. Um, Vivi is a historian of the Jewish East End, um, most recently at Queen Mary University. She's the author of Whitechapel Noise, Jewish Immigrant Life in Yiddish Shot, Song and Verse. And she's the editor and translator of London Yiddish Town, which is East End Jewish life in Yiddish sketch and story. I also know she's the translator of a couple of previously untranslated Esther Kreitman stories that are coming out, I believe, in the next year or so. Um, but as well as being a writer, editor, translator and academic, Vivi is a performer in her own right. So it's also worth mentioning that she's a the theatrical performer and Yiddish pop singer with the bands Klezmer Club and Kat Shanus. And she's director of the Great Yiddish Parade and ch vice chair of the Yiddish Cafe Trust. Um, so she's absolutely at the centre of London, London's Yiddish literary scene right now. So I can't think of anyone better to talk about the London Yiddish literary scene in the time of Esther Kreitman. Welcome, Vivi. Thank you, Aviva. What a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. I've been I've known Aviva for many, many years um, in lots of incarnations. And so it's really lovely to be here with you and with such an illustrious, interesting group of people. So thank you very much. The Kreitmans, Hinder Esther, Avram and little baby Moshe arrived in London in 1914. As Esther stepped off the boat, she came into this completely vibrant city with a Yiddish speaking community concentrated in the East End of London. Most of the immigrants there were, were poor, they were workers and they, um, um, different degrees of poorness, but they were workers and they worked lots of them in the sweatshops of the tailoring industry and the cabinet makers and hat makers trying to improve their conditions. There were also a pretty mobile entrepreneurs who were living there, who had made enough money to move out of the East End from the what they called slums into better neighborhoods. 
And there were Yiddish speaking intellectuals. There were journalists and writers and editors and critics and essayists and playwriters and songwriters and actors. There were lots and lots of people there who were making the area a very vibrant space. Kreitman, as she came, wrote, came in from Antwerp. Um, and she came um, with a number of people who were in the um, diamond trade. And she wrote about, writes about this so evocatively in her novel, Brillianten. And in the diamond trade in Antwerp, you have a whole different range of people working in it. You have the wealthy people, you have the merchants and the brokers, and then you have the workers who are lowly, the lowly paid polishers and the cutters um, as her husband, Avram was. And Kreitman humorously alludes to the difference between the East End tailors and the other workers, where um, someone is going around asking all these new immigrants, what are you doing? And they're saying, oh, we're cutters. And they were going, oh, yes, cutters like tailors. We know that. And they're really insulted by it and say, but no, we're not that sort of cutter. So there's a sort of like... Um, a rather snobbish class that go um, uh, that goes on, but for Kreitman, the Polish inflected Yiddish that is spoken in the East End, bagel not bagel, is what she is used to, and um, so she's got an immediate connection, if you like, with them. I'm going to share my screen now and show you some pictures. Okay. Let me know if you can't see them, Aviva shout. So the Kreitman family settled in Stoke Newington and Kreitman became an integral part of this load of Yiddish writers that you see here. Um, all of these writers published stories or essays or novels or feuilleton. Feuilleton was the word that was used. Um, it's, a, it's a word from French, but it's used to mean an urban sketch that was in the press and they wrote essays and they wrote them in the newspapers and journals, some of them later published books with this material, they made collections. But when Kreitman came, she knew that London had a Yiddish literary tradition. It was a Yiddish literary tradition that had included two giants, if you like, of literature. And although they had gone by the time she came, she was aware of who they were. Can you see that next slide? Yeah, okay. So they were Morris Vinchevsky, who was an editor and poet and satirist who had left a huge legacy from his socialist writing and editing of newspapers and poems that were popular amongst the workers. And the second person was the Hebraist anarchist, Joseph Chaim Brenner, who was mainly focused on Hebrew, but in London he wrote in Yiddish too. Um, he had to have his arm twisted to do that, but um, he, he, he did write significant work in Yiddish, but Vinchevsky had left for the US before she came and uh, before the turn of the 20th century and Brenner had moved to Palestine um, after that. But the legacy they'd left was really important. So she knew she was coming into a place where there had been or there was Yiddish um, culture going on. And as she stepped off the plane, she was not short of a newspaper to read because at the time in London, Der Yiddische Express, the top right picture there, is was flourishing. And underneath it, the fledgling Die Zeit, edited by Morris Meyer, was in its infancy. During the war, there was the short-lived Milchoma Telegraph. And then there was also, during the war, Die Welt and the Ovent Nias. And after the war, there was Leo Koenig's Renaissance and Der Familiefreund and Die Post. There was a lot of places where people could um, be publishing their work. And what you see here is a, a story by um, Esther Kreitman that was published in Die Post. In fact, Die Post took over the Yiddish Express. And what's really important about that bit of information is that it offered a lot more opportunities for women to write. And in particular, Kreitman's colleague, Katie Brown, and she wrote women's material like women's pages and she was one of their key feuilleton sketch writers. Um, now the Post's feuilleton column and all of these newspapers had columns called feuilleton, um, had a rotating group of writers that were different ones were writing each day or each week. And of, occasionally, as we see here, Esther Kreitman had that space. By 1930, Kreitman was an integral part of this small but expanding literary scene. And it was expanding because lots of writers came to London. And a, a lot of them came to London because they knew that there were writers there and that they had family there. So for example, Summer Liskey, who you see a picture of here, was scared by an anti-Semitic incident that 
affected him personally in Vienna in 1913. He came to London because he had a brother already in London called um, Shai Fuchs. His future wife, Sonia Chossid, who was Cedo, who you see here, who was an essayist, turned up in London because she knew Liskey and had his name scrawled on a postcard um, by her brother, Mordecai, who was also a writer. Um, and, and Sonia herself was a writer. London writers gathered in groups around key figures. There was a group of journalists around Maurice Meyer, who was the editor of the site, and Kreitman attended that group. And there was another group around the intellectual Leo Koenig. In 1937, the poet Abram Nochum Stenzel arrived in London from Berlin. And just before World War II, the well-known fiction writer Avram Fuchs arrived, who was another brother of Liskey. Yes, there were lots of those brothers. He arrived in London um, because he had his brothers there. And one of the things he did, he writes, his first duty of a writer was to go and visit the singer in London, Esther Kreitman. In 1938, Stenzel set up Die Freund von Yiddish Loschen, the Friends of Yiddish. It was a literary group meeting every Shabbos afternoon, and in 1940, he established the literary journal Loschen and Leben Language and Life, in which Kreitman's stories were also published, and she was a, a regular at this group. But it was hard for women writers. Women's writing may have been literary and popular and really like people gravitated towards it and read it a lot. But the writers themselves were constantly harangued by critics who used words to describe them like nervous, hysterical, mad. In his memoir, Maurice Kreitman, Hazel's father, wrote how his mother used to go to Maurice Meyer's journalist circle every Friday, and I'm quoting, Friday mornings, with a dab of lipstick to her lips, she goes to collect the several welcome shillings she's paid and joins the weekly assembly of journalists and literati in a Whitechapel cafe. When I come home from school, she has harsh words for these scribblers who respect her writings, but not the writer. Now, I want to just to make a side comment, because... Not only did London have these literary groups of people and individuals and writers, but there were also literary families. So here we have three families who had a London connection. As you see, we've got the singers where only Esther was in London, but it's, she's from a literary family. And then in the middle, we have um, the Fuchs family, which was Avram and uh, Summer Fuchs. Um, Summer was all changed his Fuchs called to change his name to Liskey, so he didn't get confused with his brother. They both wrote short stories. And on the left, we have the Chossid family. We have Mordechai and Sonia, who were both in Vienna, and then she came to London. Um, and as we see, Esther Kreitman's son, Morris, married Avram Fuchs's daughter, Lola. So we have a real sense of these like dynasties, literary dynasties, who are sticking well together. There were postcards, a series of postcards that I was very kindly given by Summer Liskey's son um, to me. And they were from Mordechai Chossid, so Summer's wife's brother, to him saying, let's get together and make a short story collection. It can be you and me and Avram, and it'll be really good. No mention of Esther Kreitman. Male critics generally found it impossible to write about women writers as independent individuals. In 1949, the Jewish Chronicle produced a short, unflattering review of Esther Kreitman's book of short stories, Yichus. Tucked away at the bottom of page 15 of the paper, not unusual for Yiddish writers to be tucked away like that, um, the first line reads, Yichus is pride in one's ancestors and relations, and the authoress of this collection of short story stories dealing with the humbling of a family's pride has reason to be proud of her brothers, I.J. Singer and Isaac Bashevis. They are both outstanding Yiddish writers. And to be proud of her son, Maurice Carr, who is well known to readers of the Jewish Chronicle, and also of her son's father-in-law, A.M. Fuchs, who holds a high place in Yiddish literature. The linking of families is essentially Yichus. Her own writings follow in this family procession. And I would like to end with a memory of London Yiddishist Isaac Goldberg, 
of a meeting between himself and Kreitman to organise what he would read from her pre-published manuscript of Brillianton at an event that was about to come up a week or so later. It was during the Blitz and the bombs were falling and people were constantly running into the shelters and Goldberg went to Kreitman's house to discuss what she wanted him to read. But she only had one copy of the manuscript. And he said, let me take it home and I'll have a look at it and I'll read it and I'll practice it. And she was very worried about this. And this is the condition she gave him. This particular translation is by Stephen Ogin. You shouldn't laugh at me, Mr Goldberg, because for a writer, their book is as sacred and dear as a child is to a mother. When a writer publishes a new book, it's like giving birth to a child. Can you imagine a mother running to an air raid shelter to save her own life and leave her child at home or at someone else's home? Would she be able to rest easy? So I'd like you to promise me that every time you go to the shelter, you'll take my manuscript with you. Don't laugh at this, Mr Goldberg. I am a mother and my book is as sacred and dear to me as my child. So what I hope I've done in this very short um, piece is just to show you that Kreitman was very much a part of these vibrant literary circles and very much a part of a vibrant Yiddish literary London. But she struggled. She really struggled with that. I mean, writers struggle generally, but to be a woman writer was even harder. And I know that Jessica's about to tell us a bit more about that now. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Vivi. I was literally gasping. I don't think I was the only one when we, you read that Jewish Chronicle <laughs> review. Unbelievable. And then to see all the different publications of her books was fantastic. So thank you. And there's lots in there you've seeded that I'm sure we're going to pull out in the Q&A. But as you said, Jessica is, it's team tagging today. <laughs> Jessica is going to take the story on because Vivi was looking at Esther in context of London. But Jessica's now going to open it up to Yiddish women writers. Um, and I'm really delighted Jessica's joining us. Um, she's the Assistant Instructional Professor of Yiddish at the University of Chicago. And that means she coordinates the Yiddish language programme and teaches all levels of Yiddish. And I'm very aware she's doing this um, from America in the middle of her working day. So thank you for taking time out for te from teaching to teach us. Um, but like everyone else in this Zoom, she's also completely multi-talented. Um, she is the editor of Ingweb, and I'm sure Emma's going to put a link to that for those who are interested, because that's a journal of Yiddish studies um, full of really interesting pieces. Um, and Jessica's also a literary translator. She's translated three books by Miriam Karpilov, Diary of a Lonely Girl, um, Judith and a Provincial Newspaper and other stories. So we're going to look forward to hearing about Esther and Miriam and all the other amazing Yiddish women writers. Thank you so much. I'm just going to get my screen share going here. And I'm really just so happy to be part of this group and to be um, presenting with all of you and learning so much from you. So thank you for these wonderful presentations. Um, and I'm sort of going to pick up, I think, a little bit of uh, where you left off. And there may be a little bit of repeating here because I didn't know what other people were going to say before me. So I apologize for that. Um, so I'm going to start us off with an article that was published in the Jewish News of California in 1991, commemorating the passing of Isaac Bashevis Singer, in which staff writer Tamar Kaufman notes that there was also a nearly unknown older sister, Esther Singer Kreitman. From a certain perspective, though, the afterlife of Esther Singer Kreitman has been a fortunate one. Though she has been labeled the forgotten sister of the Nobel Prize winning Isaac Bashevis Singer, Compared to many Yiddish writers, especially women who wrote in Yiddish, she was never entirely forgotten or unknown. She was fairly well known during her lifetime in the post-war Yiddish the Circle of London, and her autobiographical novel, Brillianten, 
was translated by her son Maurice Carr's Diamonds and published in London in 1944. And Der Tanz, also translated by her son as Deborah, was published in 1946 in London um, and then uh, was printed in America for the first time in 1984 under the print imprint of uh, Virago Press. And um, she's gotten, um, though she got little praise or acknowledgement from her more famous older brother in her lifetime, um, younger brother in her lifetime, Chavez rarely made mention of his sister's literary talent. And when he did, he presented her as a writer of smart, humorous letters, relegating her to a genre of less literary cachet um, and associated with the womanly and the domestic. Um, he described her work as etliche gornischt kein schlechte Bücher, several not all bad books. Still, her family connection to Bashevis made her a ripe candidate for literary recovery. His fame rendered her relative obscurity in stark relief and dramatized how women had been written out of the literary canon precisely at a moment when the second wave feminist movement called for the, the recovery of women writers. Um, so, so we kind of see this this um, idea of the the kind of romantic idea of the the forgotten Yiddish uh, writer, the sister, um, was very intriguing. Um, when Joseph Cohen wrote a review of Deborah for the Detroit Jewish News, he called Kreitman a Cinderella, whose story was one of the best known in the Jewish world because of the fame of Isaac Bashevis Singer's story which had then been recently reissued in separate book form and adapted to film by Barbara Streisand. Although um, Cohen notes that Singer, to my knowledge, has never mentioned the fact that he even had a sister and that she was uh, the source for his inspired story. In this way, Kreitman was at once made to be an exception. As one reviewer of Deborah explained, the book is a curiosity, one of the only books to explain shtetl and ghetto life from a female viewpoint and also made to stand in for the very idea of the forgotten Yiddish writer in general. Her marginality alongside her brother's successes was the model for Yiddish women writers being devalued and shunted aside. And she was among the first such women writers to be recovered. So this process al also became a model for the recovery work we're still experiencing today. Joseph Cohen also notes that Kreitman's writings offer a corrective to her brother's perspective on women overall. What her brother has often deprived Jewish women of Cinderella Kreitman has restored, as well as detailing the story of the way women were failed by their parents and the patriarchal systems that raised them and shut them out. Thus, in the content of her work and in her own life story, Kreitman was the perfect object for writing the injustice of Yiddish's histories of misogyny. So here's some, some uh, publication history for Deborah, their Shadim Tanz. And we can see also it's been uh, quite uh, translated as well. Um, so what's happened since then, since that moment of interest that accompanied the publishing of Deborah by Virago Press, we can see that there was sustained interest in Esther Singer Kreitman in particular. The work was republished several times, each time hailed an, as an important contribution to the vastly neglected genre of feminist literature. It has recently made its way into the ranks of world literature, translated into multiple languages. It has been the subject of some, though not much, scholarship. In particular, Anita Norwich, a scholar of I.J. Singer, turned her attention to Esther Singer Kreitman's writing. But largely, even Kreitman, taken to be exceptional at a time when most scholars believed women simply hadn't written prose literature in Yiddish, was overlooked in favor of more critically acclaimed writers. In the meantime, until recently, writing by women who wrote in Yiddish continued to be overlooked. So for a brief moment, I wanna give you an overview of what the recovery of women who wrote in Yiddish has looked like in the past and in its most recent iteration. I wanna give credit especially to those scholars and translators who were writing against the tide at a time when there was not enough appetite for scholarship or translations of women writers in the early 1990s. Those are the efforts that lay the groundwork for where we are today during which um, I'm very pleased to report is a veritable sea change in Yiddish studies in which women's writing is translated, disseminated, taught, enjoyed, and studied with academic rigor and innovation. In 1980, scholar Norma Fain Pratt published her groundbreaking article, Culture and Radical Politics, Yiddish Women Writers, 1890 to 1940, in which she addressed a gap in English language writing about Yiddish literature. 
women's writing was at the time hardly acknowledged to exist. She stitched together remnants of writers' lives and created order and power from them, and she collected, recovered, and studied these writers throughout her lifetime. Poet, translator, and scholar Irina Klepfitch, pioneer of Jewish American and lesbian poetry and a pivotal figure in the recovery of Yiddish women's writing, recalls that she likewise began this work in earnest in the 1980s, when she was an out Jewish lesbian activist who understood that Ashkenazi Jewish feminists were in search of intellectual, artistic, politically activist uh, Yiddish foremothers that they did not have access to because of a language barrier and because these histories had been obscured, a need that Klepfitch also identified in herself. I was shocked, she wrote, to realize that despite all my years of, of studying Yiddish and Yiddish culture, I had not read a single Yiddish prose work by a woman. Complete silence. And of course, if women were not part of Klepfitch's Yiddish education, how much the more so were women inevitably absent from collections of existing translated Yiddish literary anthologies and histories. It was in response to this palpable silence that in the 1980s and 1990s, other feminists began to work to identify, read, and translate women's Yiddish prose texts as well. Frida Foreman, a Yiddish enthusiast who founded and directed the Women's Educational Resource Center at the University of Toronto, assembled a collective of translators who sorted through books owned by people in retirement communities and in libraries looking for women writers. Once they had found enough source material, they split it up and together they created the volume they would publish in 1994, Found Treasures, Stories by Yiddish Women Writers. The anthology included one story by Esther Singer Kreitman. For um, these women and others, reading Yiddish literature by women led to a feeling of imperative to translate. Australian feminist translator Hinda Burstein describes it this way. I want to share what I have found. I want to give these women back their voice. I can do that by translating their articles into English as a feminist, I need to bring that knowledge, that evidence into the public sphere. On October 28th to 29th, 1995, a landmark conference took place at Hunter College in the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, sponsored by the Jewish Women's Resource Center, National Council of Jewish Women, New York section. Die Freuen, Women and Yiddish, Tribute to the Past, Directions for the Future, included over 500 participants gathered to discuss women's contributions to Yiddish culture in an event that included readings, lectures, workshops, and performances. In the years that followed this 1994 publication of Found Treasures, translations of Yiddish literature by women were still few and far between. The feminist journal Bridges was an ongoing source of support for um, such work, and individual volumes such as the translation of Esther Singer Kreitman's memoir and the 2013 anthology, The Exile Book of Yiddish Women Writers, attest to continued interest in this writing. But these translations were not always part of the prestige publishing venues such as Yale University's new Yiddish Library series. How can we account for this? Perhaps it was because many of the translators of women's Yiddish literature were not tenured professors. Indeed, many lacked the credential of the PhD and those who were tenured established their credibility to some degree by writing on the male writers the Academy took more seriously. Translation itself remains undervalued labor in the Academy how much the more so translation of non, translations of non-canonical, marginalized women writers. But in the late 2010s, we had finally come into a moment when this literature was being taken up anew with extraordinary energy, creativity, and commitment. Yiddish scholar and translator Anita Norwich combed through card catalogs, bibliographies, archives, and literary, bi uh, literary biographical encyclopedias uh, for women writers of prose fiction. Uh, the Yiddish Book Center's Translation Fellowship offered professionalization uh, train and training for budding Yiddish translators and began to prioritize previously under-translated aspects of Yiddish culture. The journal I edit, in the Journal for Yiddish Studies, has been steadily soliciting, encouraging, and editing essays, translations, and articles, and reviews about women's writing in Yiddish. With each new publication, so grows the interest of the reading community, many of whom uh, were and are budding younger Yiddishists, translators, and scholars. When I published my second translation of Miriam Karpolov's writing in, in, in uh, 2022, Yiddish scholar Sunny Yudkoff wrote about my and other translations that had come out in the same year, that the library of Yiddish women's writing would grow so quickly and become so diverse once seemed unimaginable. So now I find myself at the center of and um, a major shift in the field of translating Yiddish literature that is going on right now as we speak. And, and Vivi Lacks, who's uh, part of this 
this uh, panel is one of the uh, leaders in this as well. This is not a new trend. Um, as Yudkoff describes it, it is a revival of a concern first enunciated decades ago. Its traction in our moment speaks to cultural shifts that allow for more niche publishing, scholarly trends that invite a focus on gender identity, and an energized generation of young scholars who are making use of the digitization of Yiddish literature to bring some of its lesser known texts to broader circulation. I'm just showing you here a sampling of the many exciting texts that have come out just in the past few years. There isn't space to show them all. Publication of Kreitman in translation was on the vanguard of all of this. Through the advocacy of her son and translator and the coattails of her dismissive younger, uh, her dismissive younger brother, her name made it into English first and paved the way for the acknowledgement that women did write in Yiddish and that when they did, they had something significant to say. Anita Norwich argues that Esther Kreitman's autobiographical works read together with her two brothers' autobiographical works, and I'll add to this her son Maurice Carr's autobiographical reflections about his mother, create a unique case study in thinking about the work of auto autobiography itself, raising intriguing questions about the reconstruction of memory, the self it is, as it is constituted in modern Yiddish writing, women's writing, and the motivations that may encourage individuals to submit their own lives to the structures of fiction and storytelling. Michael Boyden reads Kreitman's novel Brilliantin to show that the author fictionalized elements taken from her own life story, such as mental instability, to address broader concerns pertaining to Jewish transit communities in Western Europe. Rita Calabrese praises Kreitman's writing for its sensual de de depictions, descriptions, her use of irony and sarcasm to present dark realities, her maturity and control, and hails her as establishing the yichas of women's writing in, uh, in Yiddish, a foremother to be proud of. Daphna Clifford particularly praises Kreitman's depictions of everyday life in Antwerp and London, explaining that in her descriptions of the undramatic events of ordinary life in which she shows characters that are not obviously exceptional, Kreitman alters our way of appraising the so-called commonplace. She excels generally in revealing feelings and states of mind in people who would otherwise be invisible. Each of these critics takes a different angle on the question, but each affirm that reading a writer, that re writer like Kreitman can reshape how we think about Yiddish literature and Jewish history, and can move us to better understand the relationship between the self and the world. Her work is instrumental in understanding Jewish women's lives from their own perspectives and to understanding the modern Jewish condition more broadly. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jessica. And again, raising all these questions, I think we're going to pick up um, in a moment with the panel. So thank you for adding to the conversation and also opening up some further um, issues. Um, shall we bring on the screen with you, David and Vivi? Um, Susanna, we are so grateful to, and we've actually had lots and lots of comments from people about how beautifully you read um, her work but unless you particularly want to we won't put you under the pressure of answering questions about her <laughs> um, so I've I've got David and Vivi and Jessica on the screen and all of you mentioned or alluded to very briefly um, the image of mental of well Vivi said it actually said kind of the perception of her and of other Yiddish women writers as mad and you mentioned Jessica mental health. And I think one of the extraordinary things that's come out of David's translations is a further understanding of that from the inside. I mean, we had known in the past that Esther Kreitman suffered from epilepsy. We have semi-autobiographical depictions of depression in her work. But what we see, David, from the letters is something quite far beyond that. Will you talk a little bit about the discoveries you made? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, and that's also, you know, why I, I titled the essay what I did. Um, um, you know, I'm feeling much better, but um, I think that, um, again, I think we, when we, when we, when we use categories like mental health, et cetera, et cetera, um, we, there, we tend to sort of um, 
sometimes look at them <laughs> from a judgmental perspective. Um, whereas I think what the letters are showing and not just her letters, but also Maurice Carr's letters that I that I did quote at the end um, is the experiential perspective of, of mental health issues um, and how how much they affect daily life and how much they affect relationships and how much they affect actual uh, interpersonal um, uh, connections. Um, and, and, I, and I think that, that those, you know, the experiential part, the, the lived experience um, of mental health issues within relationships between people, um, you know, they they sort of bracket some of the judgments we might make uh, hastily um, when we understand um, the 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 actual costs and 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 Maurice Carr's um, memoir is um, in you know from my reading of it a real um, um, you know reckoning <laughs> from from. Uh, from his perspective, you know, the original title was uh, uh, "Mother's Son," or some, you know, I don't know. I think it was, and and it was really about. It's really a, it's not about her at all. It's about how he finally got out of the house, <laughs> um, and and I think that that is his perspective. You know, that's one perspective, um, and and so that's that's where I think the importance of these texts comes is that. Um, we we find, or in in texts and certainly in discussions, in general discussions, we find um, these kind of, or in reviews, let's say these short reviews that that, that were quoted, that, um, we find these sort of general judgments, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the letters show us real people. Um, really fighting and really struggling with real mental health issues. Mm. Um, and I, but I just feel like that's really important for grounding us um, and 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 bringing us closer to the to the um, to the lived experience, I guess. Yeah. When you say really struggling, just for those people in the audience who may not have read the article yet, you know, she writes to Isaac about going through, ECT, electroconvulsive shock therapy, for example. Um, you know, these are very, very difficult experiences. But it's a hard thing to talk about because there is also this way of throwing away women's work by calling women mad. So I, I think Vivi wants to maybe come in and... Yeah, well, I mean, I guess what it's clear to me, having looked at a number of women who are writing in London, is that some of the same, I mean, clearly women were struggling with real mental health um, illnesses and problems, um, but there was not enough support because over and over again, it, it, it seemed to me like what better, more normal way to respond to the situations that, 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 they, were, that they were up against could they have had? I mean, you know, it's like, so certainly there may have been mental health issues, but on top of that, because of the fear and worry of the time or because of not getting any support for their writing and because of just the way people are treating women and women who are struggling to write, it's like, it, it felt like it was the most normal response in the world to be going crazy, you know, and I really feel for these women. Another one um, that I mentioned earlier was Sido, who was um, Sonia Chosid, who, and Katie Brown towards the end of her life as well, when she got depressed, she was just dumped, really. There's a, there's a whole way of the way people are responding to people's very real emotional and mental issues uh, just exacerbates them hugely. And, um, yeah, and then and they're often t the women taking it on themselves rather than seeing that it's exacerbated by society's response to them. So, yeah, Jessica, I, I I do think there's there's such a difference between 
the way um, that writers are treated depending on gender when they have mental mental difficulties or emotional health difficulties, right? There's the, the mad genius we should all listen to in their struggle. And there's the hysterical woman who we should now not listen to because she's struggling. Um, and, and I think, and we, we, I think we see a, almost a, a, a divergence of paths, right? The, the, the struggle is, an, is a, a demonstration of genius in the man and a demonstration of worthlessness in the woman. Um, and so I think we're at a moment now when finally it's, I think, okay to talk about women's mental health issues and, and emotional health issues context of their genius, right? In the context of, like, isn't it amazing that a person is able to experience these things and write about them and we can read about those perspectives and learn about what it what it felt like to live through that um, or, or someone who was able to produce in that context uh, is, I think, a, a shows what a remarkable writer she was. Um, and I think it's very um, important and exciting to have an opportunity to read about those struggles um, and dignify them rather than read about them and um, see them as a reason to throw the writer away. Mm, absolutely. I, I just want to do a follow up from that because we've had a question in from Suzanne Korn and she said, did any of these Yiddish women writers write under a pseudonym or a male, particularly a male pseudonym to get away from these depictions of being seen as lesser or mad? Or is that something just not done? So there were a number of women who wrote, first of all, pseudonyms were very common in Yiddish writing in general. So there were a number of women who wrote under multiple pseudonyms, uh, some of which were um, uh, just one letter or, you know, a first, first uh, initial last name, something like that, that would make them um, appear sort of gender neutral. But there also was a kind of cachet to being a woman writer, um, and in fact, there were men who used women pseudonyms. This is something that my colleague Ayala Brin has written quite a bit about, uh, the way that um, a popular writer uh, uh, who wanted to sell newspapers could you know, appear sort of sexy by having a, a, a woman's name, and that would make it easier to sell um, particular kinds of writing that were geared toward women audiences or popular audiences. So, and so it kind of went multiple ways um, but yeah, there was a lot of use of pseudonym and some of that was for, um, to, to mask particular kinds of, uh, social, um, socioeconomic and, uh, and gender identities in order to make, um, the story appear more desirable. Mm. That gender play was something Isaac Bashava Singer was fascinated by, um, right, David, there are several stories, not just gentle, where he looked at kinds of the issues around if a woman tries to be too like a man and kind of the problems that can come from that. I mean, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on to that. Um, he, he, he was interested in, in a lot of things. One of one of my favorite stories is called Disguised, which is about an Aguna who goes looking for uh, her husband uh, who's left her um, and then finds him living as a woman with another man in another shtetl. Um, I mean, these were these were you know questions that very very much interested him, um, and and yeah, I mean, um, there was I think that for 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 him it was certainly the experience of his sister, but it was not uh, only that experience. I think he was he was um, just sort of fascinated by. Um, just the different ways and different, you know, of the fates take and personalities take. Um, um, and he incorporated everything around him into his texts, uh, including his sister, uh, in certain ways. And just just to go back for a second, I've, you know, I've, on, on a completely different topic, I've done not a little bit of research on, uh, on electroshock therapy and electroconvulsive therapy. Um, from the 50s and also and also currently um and you know Car carrie i don't know how many people are familiar with carrie fisher's uh memoir shockaholic um where where she both talks about 
uh, you know, her need for for ECT, but also uh, one of the most powerful um, sentences there is is that it has a voracious uh, appetite for memory, and and that that I just wanted to, to kind of emphasize that that one of the reasons that I chose that uh, there was no room to really go into this whole element uh, in the essay, but one of the reasons I chose that refrain as as the topic is because when you read about people who've uh, gone through ECT, both people who have done it um, under coercion and also people who really choose it and and repeat and go back to it repeatedly. And, and, it, and the debate there is fascinating isn't the word, it's crazy, it's it's bipolar. <laughs> the, the debate itself of, of, um, of how ECT functions in a person's actual life. Um, but there is something about the shock and, and this kind of um, strange um, evenness that comes afterward, this kind of um, amnesia, you know, loss of loss of memory, et cetera, um, loss of certain memories. And, and there's something about the repetitiveness of her letters from especially that last period that you really, I mean, it, I have, have read several several books at this point and, and articles about ECT, and and I just sort of recognize it there. And it's and it's I'm not, not I'm not making a, a a statement about that. I'm just pointing, kind of observing that that was one of the things that pulled me toward that refrain was just this kind of like repetition of of this um sentence i'm doing much better you know this this sort of um difference in tone she signs her name differently also um and um and you know it there's no question that that the choice which which appears to have been made mostly with her with her son uh maybe her husband um at that time in the 50s, um, that choice was sort of really affected her her uh, her state, you know. So interesting. Um, and that's before we even go into kind of how she herself envisioned that that mental illness is demonic. Um, which is also, well, maybe we'll come to that in a moment because there are loads of questions from other people before I bring my own in. Um, I'm going to go out a little bit before we go back in. Um, Brian Shiet, who many people know is an amazing literary scholar in his own right, um, he's asked if you know about Clive Sinclair's 1983 book on the Singer family. Um, so he says it seems to have been forgotten, but was important at the time. Um, and it included a good deal on Esther and her fiction and letters. Um, and I'll just kind of throw into that additionally, you know, he's mentioning that book, but obviously it was Clive Sinclair who wrote the introduction to the publication of Deborah and then the big essay for Lilith that brought her to kind of feminist conscious in the 90s. So how do you feel about that? Do you know his work? What What do you think about the fact that it was Maurice Carr, Clive Sinclair, it was all these men who were bringing her into the public domain? Yeah, thank you for it. it um, I, I should have mentioned it in the in the talk. And so thank you to Brian for, um, for bringing that up. And yeah, I, I think it's not surprising that it was a lot of uh, men in the beginning because it she's so early and it's at a point when there are fewer um, prominent women scholars in general, right? And so this kind of um, um, public sphere in which she's being brought in the in the nineties um, is one that it was more male dominated than our current one. Um, so it, that has a kind of logic to it. Um, but I also think that maybe that accounts for how Esther Kreitman gets taken up in a way that maybe other figures uh, have a delayed uh, entry into the Yiddish public sphere, as it were, um, because she has male champions, um, which I think um, is important. And in, in addition to these, as I call them, sort of literary coattails 
that she has, um, which is not to disparage her or her work. Um, I, I'm not in any way saying that she's not deserving of attention, um, but that uh, it does um, help to explain how she gets the, detention, the attention uh, that she deserved, although she deserved even more of it. Hmm. Fascinating. And of course, we've got another of her male champions with us. I mean, David, who has been translating and editing her. And actually, we have a question from Elaine Burmett, specifically aimed at David, saying, what do you think, David, is the only man on the panel of the problem of dismissing Yiddish women writers as worthless historically? I think that that question is too big for me to answer. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> um, no, I think that, I mean, that was, you know, I don't know. I guess I would say, you know, what 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 is happening? Um what you know, what's driving you, right? What what's what's driving your your activism, let's say. You know, for me it was um I came to Besheva Singer for my own reason. I did my doctorate on Besheva Singer. I ended up in his archive because I was looking for essays. Um, and I I was there for a month and I ended up having finishing my my work more or less in three weeks, the preliminary work of of scanning everything I needed. And I said, okay, I have a week, let's look at the letters, you know. And so um and I was and and I would say that I was i I was and am driven as I've repeated, you know, I just would repeat what I said. I'm I'm really interested in in family dynamics. And it was clear to me that this was just a voice that was missing in the conversation, you know. So um so to me, keeping that top of mind or or sort of continuing to prioritize that, even though um the literary life and 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 surviving as an academic, as a writer, as a translator, et cetera, you're constantly juggling whatever projects you can pursue and bring together and and apply for and 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 get support for, you know, and this is these are years and years of of doing that, but not sort of not giving it up. And, you know, I am the male voice on this panel, but I think for, for, you know, in my own con uh, conscience, let's say, there were several times where I was, where I offered this to women writers and editors, I mean, translators and editors, um, just to let them know, hey, this is here, it should be translated. Um, and for X, Y, Z reason, they weren't in a position to, 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 to undertake that project. Um, by the time it became possible to actually do it, I did feel a kind of um, um, sense of mission to 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 do the translation and to, but it had to do also with the level of familiarity I'd gotten with the family and with there was a lot of reasons why I felt like okay now I actually want to also be the one uh, to do it but it that wasn't the be the beginning I would say. Mm -hmm. How does that answer you, Elaine? <laughs> I brought you on screen just to see. Kind think. of. It's just, it, it's so frustrating that um, uh, Isaac Singer was so lauded and famous and in such a good position to promote the person who obviously gave um, him such a, an important role and gave him such a gift um, that he failed to 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 give her the acknowledgement that she i mean so beautifully read i must say um but clearly beautifully written as well um that, that he failed to give her the exposure that he could have done he was in a, a an absolutely prime position to do so and i, I just feel angry in a way that it's taken all this time and effort um, to to acknowledge her, it, it, it is absolutely no disrespect to you, David. It's just that. No, I just think, um, I just think what I'm trying. I think what I'm what I hope is what I hope is that publishing the material itself 
will just chip away a little bit at those kinds of narratives because I really think that um, resentment, um, like that, are 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 they flatten the story? I really, really think that they flatten the story. I think that um, understanding Besheva Singer uh, as a character, as a person, as a writer, um, also in relation to his brother, meaning let's just put it this way, the way that he lauded his brother uh, later in certain phrases and in certain ways does not in any way reflect his actual relationship to his brother, which was completely estranged and fraught um, and reflects more, you know, guilt, uh, guilt than anything else. I, I, I think that the, the, the real stories are just, a, it, it's a complicated, complicated family dynamic between all the siblings. There is no happy story here there is no good people and bad people there's just three really strong individuals really strong individuals four actually you know uh, just one happens to essentially commit suicide by being ultra ultra pious and orthodox and refusing to eat um food that isn't kosher but um you know for three writers uh, with very strong personalities, you see it in the, and, and it's in the letters, um, who really each forge their own ways um, and never actually find any um, common, uh, any way to, to really ultimately support each other. Um, you know, Israel Joshua Singer is given credit a lot for 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 championing and supporting Besheva Singer, but that's also not really exactly the story. Uh, Abe Khan is actually the one who turned to Israel Joshua Singer and asked him, "Hey, is this Besheva your brother? You know, because I've read something and it's interesting to me." And he kind of, you know, there's there are elements of of the relationship that are just like I said, much more nuanced, much more fraught. And um, and I just from my from my perspective where I where I sit, I learn a lot more about human uh, relationships and existence by by sort of leaving those relations um, um, raw and and unresolved, rather than sort of presuming that. Um, that people could have done or should have done different things. I mean, if 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 I was going to have a conversation about what Besheva Singer should have done with his siblings, it would not begin or end with his relationship to his sister. It would it would go through basically everybody he knew, mm -hmm. his son. It's I mean, yeah, and and also that he's operating in a in a context in which. Uh, he's not the only person who doesn't acknowledge the the labor or importance of not only women writers but of women in all sorts of fields. Um, and so that's um, I think your point about thinking about these these people as people operating in a broader world. Um, I, not that it excuses, but it does at least mitigate or contextualize um, the kinds of things, uh, Elaine, that you're that you're finding so angering. I'm really sorry because I'm feeling like we're now about to leave this conversation in a place that's raw and unresolved but I am going to have to bring us to a close but maybe that's the thing on both both hands you know the complexity of it and seeing her as a strong person and a complicated figure not as a, a shell or quote unquote just a woman you know, that shows that we really are doing something in terms of bringing her to light and exploring her story, her writing, her life, her relationships. Um, but on the other hand, it also says to me there's a huge amount more work to be done. So I hope that we'll do that in the magazine. We're going to keep working, I hope, um, with the Singletary Estate. 
I'm we're definitely going to keep working with Jessica and Vivi as well as David at Vivi's Impact coming back in a few weeks time um so I hope you'll all join us in the audience as we keep having these conversations and keep reclaiming the past um, I'm going to say thank you to all of you but I'm going to bring Emma on to do a proper thank you before I do and just tell us what's happening coming up so Emma do you want to pop on screen there we go hi everyone as Aviva said um, I'd love to thank you all for bringing Esther Kreitman to life uh, and to Susanna as well um, and for kicking off our series with such colour and generosity, um, you've really, you know, set us up for such an interesting uh, series to come with this uh, world of the London Yiddish scene um, and how it connects with the scene in America as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and upcoming uh, next week, we will be joined by David Mazawa. Um, who's a former um, senior journalist and editor at the BBC, but he's now the Yiddish Book Centre's uh, research bibliographer uh, and the chief curator and writer of Yiddish, a global culture, which is one of their exhibitions, uh, their permanent exhibitions. Um, so he will be taking us on a trip around the world in Yiddish. Um, and then, as Aviva said, we will have Vivi back with us uh, on the 27th of March um, alongside Dr. Edna Nachshon. Um, and they will be looking at Yiddish popular culture in London and New York. Um, and then on the 3rd of April, we'll be joined by Michael Rosen and Sophie Herxheimer to talk about Yiddish influence in their writing. So writing in English, but how Yiddishisms have come into their work. Um, and then finally, um, we'll be joined by Professor Naomi Seidman, um, who will be introducing us to Freud in the Yiddish press. Um, so yeah, lots of things to look forward to. Um, and I'll just leave a link in the chat if you want to get booking. Um, and I'm also going to leave some links um, to the work of some of our speakers tonight. Um, and I'll also put those in the link that is going to go out to you, uh, the email that's going to go out to you tomorrow um, in case you want to pick those up. Um, so yeah, lots of further exploration of Kreitman, of Bashevis Singer um, and of the Yiddish scene in general. Um, so yeah, thank you again to our speakers tonight and hopefully we'll see lots of you back in the following weeks. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you all thank the speakers. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.